Did the Israelis kill Iran's president? No, no. Um, bad terrain, bad weather, and a very old uh, plat air asset uh, ended up killing uh, Raisi and and the foreign minister Abdullahi and and, and uh, the provincial governor and a couple others. Um, I know it's a, there's been a lot of uh, because there always will be something like this happens. The first thing you're going to get is oh it's the Israelis oh it must be the CIA. I've heard that one several times in the past couple of days. Um, but the truth of the matter is they were flying in a, a very very old Bell. Uh, 212 helicopter, um, and uh, the terrain up there is awful along that border with Azerbaijan, and the weather was was as bad as it could get. Um, so it's uh, you know it's uh, look you don't want any well I was about to say you don't want anyone to die you don't want to wish ill upon anyone, but Raisi was a horrible brutal individual who got to the top of the heap at the Iranian regime by being more brutal uh, and and more oppressive than others. Oh, you know what, let's, I hate to ask a detailed technical question, Mike, but I found that to be so odd because I, 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 after reading everything, I came to the same conclusion as foggy, crappy terrain, old, crappy helicopter. Now, I realize Iran is not the United States of America financially, but they do have enough money floating around. Isn't it odd that such a big cheese important person would one even fly in such conditions? And two, why is he in a World War One helicopter? I'm exaggerating, but why is he in that ancient piece of crap? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm impressed that you know Farsi because the word for Iranian president in in Farsi is big cheese, uh, and so <laughs> you know he he definitely look he you would think that they would put him in the in the best platform they could, and and you know maybe in those circumstances and where they were flying out of. Remember, they were using local assets because of where they were. Uh, they'd gone up to uh, open a, a joint dam project with Azerbaijan. And so, you know, it wasn't as if they were flying these helicopters from Tehran, but, um, and, and you know, frankly, never miss an opportunity from the Iranian regime's perspective to blame the U.S. for anything. They've actually said, look, it's the U.S.'s fault for this crash because of your sanctions, meaning the U.S. sanctions. We haven't been able to modernize our, our Air Force. And so, therefore, it's the U.S.'s fault. Yeah, of course. Okay, let's focus on foreign relations. I, I, I could easily see our, for, our allies, our enemies, a realignment of American foreign policy, especially with what's going on right now in Israel. Biden administration's worried about their poll numbers, worried about re-election, keep throwing stumbling blocks in front of the Israelis. Israelis aren't happy about it. They're basically giving Biden the middle finger. What's happening right now, Mike? Yeah, we're seeing a, a, a very interesting confluence of events, right? First of all, Hamas is, is being rewarded for their terrorism. Uh, because you're starting to get a, a break in, in what had been precedent, meaning um, the concept that you don't, the only way you get a two state solution uh, involving Israel and Palestine was direct negotiations between those parties, right? But now, uh, I mean, just today, um, Norway and, and uh, Spain and Ireland came out and said that they will have a ceremony on the 28th of May announcing that they will be recognizing the Palestinian state. Uh, and that's a that's a that's a serious break with tradition because you haven't had any group of seven nations involved in that you know uh, position before. So you've got this going on. You've got the Biden administration trying to figure out their policy towards Israel based on poll numbers and the desire not to lose the youth vote um, and the Arab American vote, particularly in places like Michigan. So that's a bad situation when you're talking about how you plot and plan your foreign policy and your, your national security concerns. You don't do that by paying attention to your domestic polling numbers, but that's what they're doing. And then you've got this uh, ramped up effort by China and Russia and, and Iran at the present time to uh, basically become a throuple. I, I, I just heard that word the other day, so I, I wanted to use it. Um, <laughs> but... You know, they're all there. You know, there's not enough room in that king size bed for Xi and and uh, and the Iranian regime and Putin, but they're trying, and that's a that's yeah. a very worrisome situation because they're doing it for different reasons. China's doing it because they they see this as a as a good opportunity to continue to push us off the top of the food chain. Russia's doing it because they desperately need China's assistance if they're going to continue their war effort, and Iran's doing it because it benefits Iran. It's in their self interest. 
So yeah, there is a lot happening right now. People need to pay attention because we are at a very, very uh, difficult and potentially dangerous moment in time. Speaking of dangerous, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, it's not there to improve your presidential poll numbers. It's not even there to reduce gas prices. It's there for other reasons, yet we continue to drain this thing, Mike, and we we're draining it a lot, and I'm getting concerned. Well, you should be, and it's, it's, I'm really glad you pointed it out because it doesn't get the coverage that it should. Uh, it's a very important topic. Uh, look, there's, there's two parts to this. One is, yeah, it's not designed to, uh, to release uh, you know, uh, quantities there when you want to drop the gas prices before an election, but that's what's been happening. Right? And so again, letting domestic polling numbers and, and political concerns drive your national security interests because that's, that's a problem. Right? People should understand that, but that's what the White House has been doing. Witness the fact, not to stray off course, but they've just canceled another $7.7 .7 billion in student debt you know, in their vote buying scheme uh, that's been going on for some time now to uh, cancel out debt and win back the youth vote, or at least shore up the youth vote. So, but the the uh, petroleum reserve is a, is, a, is a serious problem because at the same time as we're doing that, obviously, we're not focused on being energy independent. And hey, I, you know, God bless the green energy movement and we should be doing that. We should be moving in that direction eventually, but we should be doing everything right now because we're not getting to an all EV future you know, five years from now, 10 years from now. You know what? It's not going to happen 20 years from now. So fossil fuels need to continue to play a role here while we let the markets and capitalism do its thing and develop new battery technology and new abilities to have a green energy future. You're a much nicer guy than me, Mike. I don't want a green energy future. I want coal plants on every freaking corner. Okay, you know what? Before I let you go, though, I need to ask about Niger. I don't understand why I should care about this country, but really smart foreign policy people like you continue to tell me I should care about what's going on there. Make me smart, Mike. Why? Yeah, Niger is is uh, you know you say tomato, I say tom tomato. It's it, you know I say Niger, uh, and it's it's important because it's another indication that our eyes off the ball and that we're losing influence overseas. So Niger demanded that our personnel leave. And we've been running a, a base there, a very important counterterrorism base since about 2012 or so. Um, not, not a lot of personnel, about a thousand uh, military and others that were there working on counterterrorism issues, working on training concerns with local African forces, you know, a very important activities. And Niger that has a military junta that has veered towards Russia uh, and away from the West and recently demanded that American forces leave, leave the base, get out of the country. The base, by the way, cost us about $100 million to construct. And now it's being taken over by Russian military forces. So <laughs> congratulations. Uh, but it's it's important because, again, it shows this 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 problem that we have. We get hyper focused on typically on one issue. And we lose focus on other things. We, we don't use resources and pay attention to and build relationships where we need to. We did it in Latin America for a period of time and we ended up with Chavez and a bunch of other problems in, uh, in Central and South America because we just took our eye off the ball and, and didn't consider how strategically important that area is. We've done the same with Africa. Uh, the DRC is another area that's, that's you know, moving away uh, from our interests. So we've got, we've got problems. And it's almost as if we can't multitask. It's not just this current administration, because it's happened before in the past with other administrations. I think it, it might be a, a uniquely American problem that we have a, a difficult time multitasking.